Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay. So, I uh, today just have a lightning talk, and I wanted to jostle your brain with uh, by challenging one idea that we 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 kind of a most for the most part accept uh, in the Scala community, which is that uh, pure functions are easier to reason about than impure functions. So I'd like to start with a puzzler, uh, which is this um, puzzle method, <coughs> uh, which takes a, an int size, and it's going to return a list of int. And what it first does is it creates a new array of that size, the past size, and it creates a var, uh, initializes it to zero, it's an int. Uh, and then there's a while loop that, uh, while i is less than the past size, it uh, mutates the array uh, and puts in, you know, array of i is i plus one. Then it increments i. Uh, and then when that's done, it just converts the array to a list and returns it. So the question for you is uh, what happens when we call puzzle and pass in three? So the four, I'll give you a multiple choice to make it slightly simpler. Um, does it one, go in an infinite loop? Two, return list one, two, three. Uh, three, return list one, two, three, four. Off by one uh, arrow, maybe. Um, or uh, four, throw ar array index out of bounds exception, which barely fit on the slide. So I'll give you a few minutes to think about it, and then we'll take a vote. It's, it's, uh, it's a lightning talk, so you don't have much time to think, so pressure. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna vote really quickly. Uh, by a raise of hands, how many people think number one? It's too dark, I can't see a single person. How many people think number two? Quite a few people. How many people think number three? There's a few threes. How many people think number four? And there's even more fours. So uh, let's give it a shot and we'll just try it out. We'll test it. Um, so basically I put the same code in a file, trust me. Uh, and now I can just load that in. And let's run it, puzzle three. Okay, so uh, most people got that. It was uh, number two. Um, and you know, this was imperative code. And what I, the, 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 the point I wanted to make is I think this is kind of a counter example of, of that thing we believe that, uh, that there's kind of a corollary to pure functions are easier to read uh, reason about than impure functions, that impure functions are hard to reason about, right? And what I've discovered is, is that imperative code can be reasoned about if it's simple. So that's one data point I wanted to sort of put out there. <clears throat> and then uh, I would like to show two examples where I think, um, <laughs> I think are really good examples of where imperative code is very difficult to reason about. So the first one, uh, it has to do with this statement, which I heard someone say at a conference like this. He was giving a talk, I was in the audience, and he said, Java is a well-orchestrated fraud. So who, does anybody have any idea who might have said that? Huh? Uh, Guy Steele. Guy Steele? That's a good guess, but no, it wasn't Guy Steele. Anybody else? Well, that's no. And I know why you said that, but <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, that's right. James Gosling said it. So this is the father of Java, and he said Java was a well-orchestrated fraud. And what he was talking about was malloc and free. So back in the early 90s, he had just finished uh, doing a lot of C coding uh, for the news uh, thing, and that sort of failed, and he was, he felt that his, his feeling was that C programmers were spending too much time chasing down memory bugs and that they should use a garbage collector. That was his idea. But C programmers, and I was one of them, just felt that would not, was not practical because it was too slow. A garbage collector would never be fast enough. So how could I like, let that take care of that? So what he did in Java is he made something that was comfortable to C programmers. A lot of things looked the same or similar. The curly braces, the if, while, for loops, those all looked similar or exactly the same as in C, but there was no way to free memory. Right, so that's, that's what uh, he said he was doing, and, and uh, that, that works. Basically, this is sort of the uh, gateway drug to garbage collection for the software industry, I think. Um, and what I, 
didn't, I mean, I had that experience where I actually was a C programmer and I was a C++ programmer and I spent gobs of time chasing down memory bugs. And I could get it right in the small, but once I got, uh, you know, once that kind of grew larger, I, I would lose track of something and I'd have a memory bug. Um, so what I realized later was why, and I didn't actually kind of have this insight until after I was a Scala programmer. So can anyone guess why malloc and free was hard? Why was it hard? Yes? Because you can only hold a certain size program in your mind. At a certain point, details will start to fall out because your mind is infinite. Yeah, so I'll repeat that. You can only hold a certain size program in your mind uh, at once after a certain size because of our brains. It gets bigger than our brains somehow. Uh, it's hard to lose, keep track of things. And that's, that's true, but, but what about the program is hard to keep track of? And how does it do with Madeline Confree? Yes? The state of the program. Yeah, I think it's state. So what, what it occurred to me is that the heap is a mutable data structure. And when I say malloc, I mutate that data structure. Basically, it's, it's keeping track of where on that data structure, what chunks of memory are in use, and which ones are available for other objects later. So when you malloc, you mutate it. And when you free it, you say, well, now that's available again. You mutate that again. This is spread out all over your program. And in the small, I mean, you can do it. But as it grows larger, because it, it, you just have to keep track in your head what you've allocated, what you needs to be freed, what, you know, you have to make sure you free each thing only once. Um, and that's just really hard to do. And the entire industry moved to garbage collection to, you know, because that mutation was hard. So I think that's a poster child for imperative codes hard to reason about. And another one, uh, which, uh, and you can't answer, is I was outside a talk where this, this guy that was famous at the time, it made a stir, uh, this guy said several world frogs later. Um, and what he was talking about was shared memory and locks. And the idea of boiled frogs is that um, if you <clears throat> throw a frog into a, a, a pan of boiling water, it hops out because it's quite hot in there. But if you put, just gently put a frog in a pan of room temperature water and very slowly warm it up, uh, they don't notice that it's getting hotter because it's just slow change and they boil. So I think. Someone tried that, and they actually do hop out. Um, <laughs> but it's a good metaphor. And what he was saying was that people, us, actually, in the 90s, when memory was expensive and programs were much smaller, we could actually kind of deal with shared memory and locks. But memory got cheaper, and programs got bigger. And it got to the point where we couldn't deal with it, but we didn't notice. That's what he was saying. So who? Who said this? And you can't answer, the one in the middle. Anybody? <laughs> it's what he said before. <laughs> Brian Getz, yes. So Brian Getz is sort of like, he took over as, he's in charge of the Java language now. James Gosson left Oracle. Brian Getz is now leading that. And um, again, a, a, the same kind of thing happened as after I came to Scala. And I had this same experience. It was hard to get this right. In the small, I could do a producer-consumer thing with wait and notify. And I could get it right, but I would end up with, you know, as things grew larger, there was this chance I would get a deadlock, right? And it was really hard to keep track of that. And looking back, after I came to Scala, I realized, well, wait, here's another example of what happens when I go to you know, invoke a synchronized method is I mutate this data structure called a monitor that's associated with an object on the JVM. Like, uh, these, all these circles are threads. This is a very busy object. Um, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight threads in it. And so these three yellow ones are in the entry set that's like waiting to acquire the lock. So when one of them goes in there, in the front door, it locks, I mean, sorry, it enters the entry set. That's mutating that data structure. When you acquire the lock and you become blue, that's mutating the data structure. It's called a mutex. Um, uh, if you call wait in there, then you go and become orange, you go into the wait set and you release a lock, that's called, that's a mutation. Um, when someone else comes in there and calls notify, the orange ones become brick red or brown, whatever that color is. Um, down here, waiting to be resurrected, that's a mutation. When someone exits, and when, so, when a, one comes you know, back from the wait method, it, which has blocked, you, know, you become, you require the thing again, all those things are mutations. This is something that's spread out all over your program, and you just have to keep track of it in your head. And it's very difficult. So I think 
memory management and thread sync, you know, shared memory and locks model are two really good examples of how imperative code is hard to reason about in the large. Okay, so <clears throat> what I find about purity is that if you have just a bunch of pure code, what's nice about it is what you keep track of is what comes back, right? You pass things in and you don't have to remember what happened behind the scenes in, in your head. You just have to look at what came back. So that's sort of from the human perspective, it's easier to keep track of that because it's right there in your face, right? It's coming back right to you and you don't have to keep track of things that happened off to the side. Um, but I think sometimes we might take purity, you know, we wanna to try to achieve purity just for the sake of purity when what we should really be aiming at is making our code easier to reason about. And there's certain kind of impure code that doesn't force you to keep track of too many things at once, and that's what I'm calling pragmatic pure. It's pure code, um, which is pure pure, and then there's this impure stuff that we do, but we don't, it's actually okay in the, from the perspective of if we want to, if we care about purity, to make our code easier to reason about. So some examples are <clears throat> object instantiation, when I create a new instance, that actually mutates that same heap. So that's a mutation. Um, and then what it does is it fills it with zeros, that's a mutation, and then it runs the constructor which replaces those zeros with something hopefully sane, that's a mutation. Um, Sometimes when something survives the first garbage collection, it actually may move it. That, that some, depends on the garbage collection al algorithm. That's a mutation. And then when it does garbage collect it, that's like a free, right? That's a mutation. So all that stuff is happening all the time. And we don't have to think about it. Um, so that's pragmatic, even though that's, a, that's imperative, behind the scenes, we don't have to think about it. And lazy valves is another one. Lazy valves, when that snaps, so the first time you use a lazy valve, it actually call, you know, invokes, executes initializer and mutates that object, but we don't, from the outside, it's referentially transparent, so we don't have to keep track of it for the most part. I mean, we sometimes have to keep track of these things because of timing or performance or whatever, but for the most part, we don't. So I, I think of that as pragmatically pure. And caching is another one. If it's a pure function that's slow, you may, put a cache in front of it, and so now it's a little bit faster, but it always returns the same thing. So from the outside, it's, in, it's referentially transparent. It appears to be pure, but on the inside, it's actually doing mutation of a mutable cache. Um, and then that puzzle method is, uh, is, you see that all over the, that kind of pattern all over the Java, a, uh, <laughs> Java, uh, yeah, it's all over Java. Uh, the Scala API, like the list exists method, has a little while loop like that. Um, where on the outside, it's referentially transparent, you pass in immutable objects, you get an immutable object back, but on the inside for performance, it's doing a, a imperative code. Uh, but, and that imperative code is small enough that you can figure it out, just like the puzzle method you could figure out because it was small enough. And even tail call optimization is doing the thing, same thing at sort of the bytecodes. I've got on the, you know, that's a, uh, a while loop that's being, it's rewriting your tail call as a while loop, um, but I don't have to think about it. And then there's, there's a weird one, which is logging. Logging is doing I.O., uh, but I still think, I don't, it's because I don't have to keep track of that I.O., that, that actually helps me reason about what happened in production. So I think logging is pragmatically pure as well. So that's, uh, that's, that's the idea. Um, so uh, before I get to q and I just wanted to mention that uh, at Artema, we do, we do Scala consulting uh, and training, and so we are hiring, we're always looking for developers, Scala developers, we are available to do consulting and training, and I am on the, uh, I'm a community rep on the Scala Center Advisory Board, so I'm supposed to represent your interests, but sometimes people don't complain to me. So I would invite you afterwards to come up to me if you have a concern about Scala and let me know. I just would like, I would like to hear it. And, and just know what, what concerns you have. So my Q&A, uh, I have uh, just one minute left and I wanna, I wanna do it differently because I wanna ask you a question. And uh, then you can, you can come up to me afterwards. Um, but the thing I'm trying to figure out is like I, I just sort of talked about this pragmatic pure. And I would like to try and figure out if I can formally define the rules that imperative code has to follow such that it can be Referentially transparent from the outside, even though there's an imperative code happening on the inside, mutation happening on the inside. Like there's some things you can't do for that to be true. You can't probably have 
side effects uh, that are doing I.O., something that's unpredictable, but like I don't know how to formally specify or explain or describe or define what that is. So that's what I was curious. If someone has some ideas about that or if there's papers or something, uh, come, come talk to me. So, okay, that's my, uh, where's the, the uh, person in charge? Because that, my, that was my 15 minutes. So should I uh, ask for one question? Okay. So anybody have a uh, comment or a question? Or, uh, I should put in my glasses. People in the back were at an unfair advantage because I couldn't see their hands without my glasses on. Um, Anybody? No? Nope. Yes, there's when's somebody. Your, when's yes. your next book? Huh? <laughs> Effective Scala. When's, is that your next book? Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to, uh, we'd like to update programming in Scala also to the three, you know, each release now, but, uh, but we are working, going to work on Effective Scala. We're giving a talk Effective Scala at, uh, in Berlin. But it basically, I think people want guidance because it's an unopinionated language. <clears throat> you know, after, after it's been around for a while, there's usually a book that comes out that tries to sort of say, well, you know, do this, not that, or prefer this over that, or that kind of thing. So that's, that's one thing. Yes? There's a bunch of stuff in Haskell with um, STM. Yes. Where you can mutably, or rather you can mutate memory as long as you're not depending on any I.O. and then run that. And similarly with freezing and thawing of arrays, so you can take a um, list or whatever and sort it in place and then create an immutable copy of that. Yes. And I mean, clearly that sort of thing is on the outside referentially transparent. Yep. I mean, I think, I mean, I can think of rules. Um, and one of them is no, I know that is, like if I take read line, you know, who knows what they're going to type? I can't say that's reproducible. Whereas if I create an immutable object, a mutable object from immutable data, it's always gonna have the same state and I have to do the same, like there's just one thread making transformations to it, they'll be the same. And then you convert it to a immutable again, it would be, it should be referenced and transparent on the outset, but I'm just curious what that is uh, formally. But yeah, that's an interesting, uh, I can look at that uh, in Haskell because uh, that's an idea. There was one more and then we gotta go right over here somewhere. Change your mind? I thought I saw a hand go up. Yes? For uh, when something is too big comparatively, because that might be different for different people. Uh, no, uh, the question was, is there a rule of thumb for when is something is too big? Um, what I heard uh, someone taught me when I was young and is that uh, methods should have, I think if you have more than, oh, I forget how many it was, but it was something like they had a number saying above this many, this many uh, parameters, you need to take those parameters and put it into one thing. And it was like nine or seven or something like that. But uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, well anyway, thanks. Uh, please come up and talk to me in the hallway if you have uh, any other thoughts about this or have something to complain about.